the last lecture of uh, mental competence we have discussed about separate chetasikas and now there are few points to be discussed uh, regarding some of the special attributes found in certain chetasikas uh, due to the uh, time restrictions i would only focus on mula normally called roots otherwise there are some other special attributes such as magga jhana and so forth uh, here we discuss about mula because uh, i also found mula has not been discussed in detail you know tradition so so today's lecture will be about mula you know we translate these as roots so how significant they are in our sasana <coughs> If you go into uh, uh, Abhidhamma doctrine, we find this uh, mula with the name of Hetu. Hetu. Hetu uh, is mula. Yeah, it starts with, uh, for example, uh, in the Dukkamatikas, you start with Hetu Bhuchaka. And in Pachaya, you find with uh, Hetu Pachaya. And also, uh, uh, yamaka we find mula yamaka so likewise likewise uh, we we have uh, whenever mula is found we can suggest that if the if mula is found in a certain list mostly the list starts with mula and also in suttas buddha mentioned these are the reasons for wholesome and unwholesome deeds so therefore they play a huge uh, very significant role in our sasana so to my understanding we can find four types of mulas in our doctrine vinyana or nama mula right this uh, this is the name given for normal roots that we discuss then kamma mula roots of actions kammas you can find them in suttas mostly then vatta mula roots for the wandering of sans in sansara vivatta mula is the roots for the attainment of supramundane achievements like magga pala and nibbana vijnana mula are the roots that we found in consciousness kamma mula are the roots for wholesome and unwholesome deeds mostly in suttas buddha was referring to this type of uh, uh, with the, the, the attribute of mulas in this manner vatta mula is the roots or reasons we can say for the continuation of samsara and vivatta mula are the reasons for us to attain the supra mundane attainments magapala and nibbana so we'll start with the vijnana mula first so another name is nama mula so when we say vijnana it only refers to uh, chitta so some can one can have a misunderstanding that mula are connected only with chitta no all the mental cluster i mean the group of chitta chetasikas which arise together are rooted in a mula so normally we say lob mula chitta but it is at that moment passa is also rooted in loba so we can call loba mula passa either. so the entire group of mentalities are rooted in a in a in a in a, in a mula it means they are connected we cannot separate them so when we say it's a root of a consciousness it means it's root of the entire cluster of the mentalities entire cluster it means chitta arises together with chetasikas so if a mula arises in them it affects the entire group not only the chitta right that's why we call nama mula nama mula so what is the so uh, what is the functioning of this mula before that we come into the enumeration there are six types of mulas loba dosa ado uh, moha aloba adosa moha what is the function of this mula so in the first part vijnana mula i'm talking basically on abhidhamma pers- mostly in abhidhamma perspective but they are related to suttas either their function is to entrench other mentalities upon the object they cognize and actions they perform these are the two functions so they entrench they make the uh, mentalities to be firm on a particular object what is this firmness i'll explain then also to become firm in performing certain actions 
so what happens we become well stable in particular action. May, it, can, it can be in the wholesome side or unwholesome side. For example, if someone is well established in spiritual practice, we call he is firmly established on this wholesome action. It means he normally doesn't go away, divert away from the wholesome practice. So this is mainly done by Mula. The function of Mula is to make the mind to be well, focused, well established on a particular object. Well established means Later on, we will be taking the same or similar objects in a similar manner. So I'll come to that point. Then the next point is, we tend to perform, uh, our mind perform to do particular actions regularly. It minds become, it becomes easier for us. So it becomes like a habitual thing. But uh, habit is some one thing. Reasons for such a habit is the mula. The mulas make the mind to become very stable on a particular habit. So there are four types of mula. Akusala mula, kusala mula, kiriya mula, vipaka mula. Right? So in Vipanga Pakrana you can find we say three mulas, six mulas, nine mulas, twelve mulas, fifteen mulas. So there are different types of uh, enumeration. So here I went to the twelve types of mulas. There are the kusala, akusala, kusala, vipaka and kiriya. So we know akusala mulas are three, loba, dosa, moha, which arise in twelve akusala chittas accordingly. Why do I say accordingly? Because not all the three mulas are going to happen in all the akusala chittas. Loba mula chittas have two more, loba and moha only. Dosa mula chitta have dosa and moha. In mo moha chittas we have only moha. So likewise, that's why it's accordingly. So kusala, kusala chitta mulas are loba, dosa, moha in 21 kusala chittas which arise accordingly because some are two rooted some are three rooted then we have kiriya chittas uh, uh, sorry uh, the numbers are wrong up and down right sorry kiriya aloba adosa and amoha uh, yeah this is a big mistake which arise in 17 sahetuka kiriya chittas sorry for that you have to correct it 17 sahetuka kiriya chittas Kiriya mulas are the aloba, adosa, and amoha which arise in 17, not 36. 17 sahetuka kiriya chittas, not vipaka. Sahetuka kiriya chittas accordingly. Kiriya mula. Then vipaka mula, aloba, adosa, amoha which arise in uh, how many? 36. 21, right? Yeah, 21 Sahetuka Vipaka Chittas. 21 Sahetuka Vipaka Chittas. So, this is how we have to correct. The Kiriya has to be 17 Sahetuka Kiriya Chittas accordingly. Vipaka is 21 Sahetuka Vipaka Chittas. Because we have 15 Ahetuka, right? 36 minus 15 is 21. We have Kiriya 20 minus 3 Ahetuka. Right? This is how the 17 and uh, the 21 is being made. Right? I think all of you have done diploma. You, you have done first semester, right? <coughs> so then uh, uh, yeah. So then uh, so mulas perform their function. There, there are two types. Now the main thing is they in French the chitta chetasikas in a particular object or in a particular action. This is done in two ways. This is done in two ways. By focusing or taking the object firmly or strongly. Right? It takes the object very firmly. These mulas grab the object very strongly. And the next way is by bringing up conducive mental atmosphere for associating mentalities to grow upon. So these are the two ways how mulas make the mentalities. They entrench the mentalities in particular object or in a particular action. So these are the two ways. So they, they have two functions. That is, first is to make the mind and uh, chetasikas to be well firmly established on a particular object. And the next thing is, I am not talking about the samadhi here. It's a different thing. So then we, it also makes the mind to be well established on performing certain actions. These two functions are performed in two ways. It's like uh, these mulas take the object firmly, strongly. So as a result, the remaining 
associated mentalities or following mentalities become well established on the object. Then also as a result, we, uh, and also then by bringing up conducive mental atmosphere, the associating mentalities and also following mentalities become well focused on an object and also tend to do the actions very firmly. So there are other two ways. So we will find out how, how they do it. When a certain types of mentalities are well entrenched upon objects, they cognize and co uh, objects they cognize and action they perform by forced two means. Similar, what, so when we say it's firmly established, it means similar mental states reappear, taking the same object or similar objects and performing similar actions. This is when I when I when we say it's well established in a particular object. It's very similar to Samadhi, but this is a different approach of explaining how establishment. So when a mind, when the mind, person's mind is well established on a particular object means it keeps on taking a, the similar object or the same object again and again. It's, it's not only while you are focusing on a, a meditation subject. This means it naturally comes to your mind. It's very well, for, well established in a particular object. And also, the person tends to do particular certain actions again and again. His mind wants to do certain actions again and again. This is what we call the mind is well established on a particular object or the mind is well established on a particular action. It means it becomes repeatedly, it occurs, taking the same object or doing the same action. So we call the mind is well established. Right? That is the meaning of getting established. So I'll read it again. Just a habit? It is a habit we can call in terms of actions. Yes. It's very similar to a habit. Yeah. So when we come into a habit, we also call about Upanishya. When we go into the lectures of causality, that is also another approach. These, I would call, are the main reasons for a person to have a habit. It's not only habits. It also causes for many actions to happen. They are like, we'll come to that point, they are like the giants of wholesomeness and unwholesomeness. They make us, uh, they are the main, we can call not the fundamental reason. I'm talking about making the mind to, uh, for us to do it again and again. You can call it a habit, right? But when we say a habit, it covers, a, to my understanding, it covers a different range. We'll come into that. Uh, we'll be talking about habit later even, right? So then, uh, <clears throat> It says, uh, when a certain type of mentalities are well is entrenched upon objects, they cognize and they act, uh, uh, upon uh, the objects they cognize and action they perform by force it to means, the, uh, what is the effect? Similar mental states reappear, taking the same or the similar objects and performing similar actions. When this repetition happens, the mind is said to be well established upon certain objects and it performing certain actions. These mulas are similar to roots of a tree. They are similar to a loop of the seed. So this simile analogy will be taken in explaining these two functions. So these are the two functions, the two ways it is. By focusing at an object steadily, steadfastly focusing, or and bringing a conducive mental atmosphere in the mind for other mental to grow. So we'll come into that point. So uh, now the simile is now the first way of like focusing, well focusing. Uh, a true, true roots of a tree normally holds the earth very firmly. More, more the firm it holds, more firmly the tree is established on the earth. So the remaining parts, like a trunk or the branches of the tree, will become, even the remaining body of the tree will be well established because the roots hold the earth, when the roots hold the earth very firmly. So this is the simile, it's just a simile. So likewise, loba dosa moha, aloba adosa amoha, takes the object very with, we call it strongly. Strong, when I say strongly, we can translate it focusing. But when you say focus, it will also overlap with another function called jhana function. Jhana function, we normally explain the mentalities which have a high focus than the other mentalities. 
So here we say it takes strong. So how do we know, how do we understand a mentality, these moolas take the object strongly? It's because it is very difficult to overcome them. It's very difficult to get rid of them. So that is, that is how we explain, that's how the teachers explain it. Yeah, uh, so when the roots are well, well uh, strongly holding the earth, the remaining parts of the tree will also be firmly established on the earth. So likewise, when the loba dosa moha, aloba dosa moha, uh, we call strongly. Yeah. When they take the object strongly, very firmly, the remaining associating mentalities also get well established on the particular object. So what happens? The following chittas starts to take the same object or similar object in a similar manner. In a similar manner. So if the, uh, the mind gets attached to a certain object, the following chittas will have the habit or get, get used to uh, get attached to a similar or the same object again and again. So the thing is, uh, these roots strongly take the object, they have a, a grasping of the object more firmly than other mentalities. They grab the object very strongly than the other mentalities. So as a result, associating mentalities, they don't grab the object strongly, but they become well established. They follow the mulas. So because of the grasping of the mula, grasping means holding of the mula of the object strongly, the associating mentalities follow them. They become well established on the object. It happened naturally. It is not something mula does purposefully. When the mula, the, like the roots are holding the tree, holding the earth firmly, the remaining mental, the remaining parts of the tree will be automatically established on the earth. So likewise, when the mulas strongly take the object, the remaining associated mentalities will also uh, be uh, focusing or well established on the object. Roots of a tree holds the earth firmly. Likewise, the six roots cognizes the object firmly, more f uh, firmly and strongly than other mentalities. When the roots of a tree are firm, rest of the parts, trunk and branches, do become firmly stable on the earth. In the same manner, when roots take the object firmly, mulas, the associated mentalities become well established upon the object. Uh, as a result, similar mentalities will follow taking the same or similar objects. This function can be seen in all four types of mula. They can be seen all types. So all the Sahitoka Chittas take their object well and become firmly established upon objects than Ahetuka Chittas. So that's why Sahitoka Chittas we call our most firm on the objects. So the functioning of the mulas, we normally say the mula hetu kicca, mahantang hetu kicca is very great in the mental sphere. We'll come to that point. A tree, uh, as a tree well entrenched, entrenched by its roots can withstand strong winds and it is difficult to be removed. Mentality is well established upon certain types of objects are very difficult to be prevented from taking those objects in the manner they are used to. It's like a habit. Right? It's very difficult to get rid of them when, we, when we, our mind is well established on this. This attribute of difficult to be prevented by opposite states can be observed in Akusala, Kusala and Kiriya Mulas, not in Vipaka Mulas. So there are two, two, two aspects I'm talking. So they become well established upon a certain object. As a result, it is very difficult to be prevented. As a result, it's very difficult to be prevented because it's been repeating. The, the, there will be a natural force in the mind for it to take the same objects again and again. Right? It's very difficult to be prevented. So how can we understand with this simile? In the unwholesome sphere, for example, if someone get attached to someone or something, it's very difficult to uh, forget it. The mind starts to go again and again and it starts to uh, take the object similar or the same object again and again. So what is this? The loba gets attached to a certain object. This attachment is what we say as strongly taking the object. Right? This is what we call strongly taking an object. It is more stronger than the T. The T we know it's a grasping, but here we call it's it's a uh, dip, we, it's we, I, what I understand is it's something like a very basic strong type of a mental quality. So it gets attached to an object. It is the outcome of moha and loba. I'll come to that point in the next lecture. So when mo, loba get attached to a particular object, it's very difficult to be forgotten. 
So therefore, the, uh, the remaining mentalities also get well established on the object. So similar chittas will start appearing taking the same object. Same thing happens with dosa. Dosa dislikes the object very strongly. So it's very difficult for us to forget a fault someone has done. Right? Someone has done. Or something, some, some un unpleasant experience. Ignorance, the strongness of ignorance can be seen because it's very difficult to overcome the ignorance regarding, regarding our Lokia objects. We perceive. So because of their strong grasping, how do we know they grasp strongly? Because it is very difficult to be prevented. So uh, that is the result of the difficulty or to be prevented is because the molars grab the object very strongly. In the wholesome, uh, in the wholesome and functional realms, functional happens to kill the arahants, uh, get detached from the body, seeing its repulsiveness. For example, if someone gets detached from the body, seeing its repulsiveness, it's very difficult for the low bar to overcome our mind. So sometimes you may feel like it is very easy to go into a kusala and it's, uh, rather than staying into kusala. But actually in our teachings, kusala is more stronger than a kusala. Kusala is much stronger than a kusala. Why do we say like that? There is no such attainment in a kusala realm that you keep on doing a kusala and you come into a state that you are not going to do kusala anymore. Right? There is no such an attainment. But in the wholesome side, there is such an attainment. You come into a very higher level, culmination of kusala, and you get rid of akusala forever. So therefore, according to our sasana, kusala is more powerful than akusala. Right? Kusala is more powerful than akusala. Why do I say that? Normally, in the, in the beginning, akusala force seems to be very powerful. So it overcomes the kusala. But if you develop, for example, there is no such an attainment you develop the akusala fully and come to the culmination and you get rid of kusala forever. No, there is no certainty. But if you develop the kusala forever, according to our sasana, or to the culmination, you get rid of akusala forever. That's what we are becoming an arahan. Right? Araha, you become arahan with the culmination of kusala. You attain, you practice, and you come into the higher stage of arahat magga, kusala, and that's the culmination of kusala. Then there will be no kusalas after that. There's a different case. But akusalas are cut off. Akusalas can never cut off kusala. Kusalas can cut off akusala. So according to Asasana, in terms of <laughs> strength, kusala is powerful than akusala. But in the beginning, you will feel when till the akusala natures are powerful, akusala can easily overcome them and go beyond them. That is true because our habitual, because there is two reasons for that. Anusya is following, there is no such a akusala anusya, akusala anusya is following and also the habitual impact and the mind also have a natural tendency to go into akusala. Buddha mentioned papas ming ramati mano, mind delights in akusala. So that is the nature. Because of these few fundamental reasons, mind always tends to go into akusala but it doesn't mean it doesn't mean akusala is powerful than kusala. Right. Can you please repeat that? Yes. What are the fundamental reasons that the mind has to go to akusala? Yeah, three fundamental reasons we find. One fundamental reason is the anusya, the latent tendency. It's something like akusala is following our mind stream. Latently, like sleeping, the latent potential akusala. Anusya we call. That is the one reason. So whenever the opportunity comes, they arise. Then that's why we, kill, we say our akusalas are not destructive. But there is no such a kusala potential which follows you. Why? That's the nature. So is it this stronger? No, this, the strength of the kusala is we, we explain and evaluate in a different manner. So these are the basic, like according to teachings, I'm unable to explain why. This is like, for example, it's unable to explain that. Some, some, now for example, if someone asks why there is a chitta, we are unable to explain. Right? So we say it, it is there. Right? Uh, uh, for, that is even in, uh, to my understanding, even in science. Right? Why, uh, uh, why the uh, gravity drags the object towards another object rather than uh, f uh, f uh, throwing it away? We cannot explain it. We can, we can explain it is dragged because of gravity. So we cannot explain certain things even in science. So in Buddhism also, if, uh, if someone asks the question, why there is only Akusala Anusaya and no Kusala Anusaya, this is unexplainable why. But we can say, since it exists, so that's why very easily Akusalas can appear when an object is similar, uh, 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 
appealing object is encounter. The next reason is the habit. This habit have two parts. Kusala habit and Akusala habit. Kusala habit and Akusala habit. They were, we call it Anupanisya, habitual force. Then the next, second, third reason is, according to the Buddha's teachings, the mind itself or the mentalities themselves are naturally delighted, delights in unwholesome mentalities. They find pleasure in it. So these are, that's also a very fundamental attributes of the mental stream. So these are the three reasons we find mind easily tends to go to the Akusala. If you want to overcome this, only way to develop Kusala is to develop the habit. Because Kusala side, we have only one portion that is the habit. So to overcome these three causes which drags you to the Akusala, you have to develop Kusala habits. But this Kusala is more powerful than the Akusala. We, even it has one, just one stream to develop. When you develop into the culmination, it can completely cut off the entire Kusala. Yes, sir. Yeah, I do one answer. Yeah, yes. Oh, okay, answer. sure. Since we were born here, we were born here because of Akusala. Okay. So uh, we stay here. This phenomenon uh, it is the uh, result of Akusala. Uh, we are the chosen one. Chosen, okay. Okay. That's why uh, we have only Akusala, Akusala, no Kusala, Akusala. What do you mean by chosen one? Uh, if we have, suppose we have Kusala, Akusala, we will not born here. So we were born here, it means we already passed by some kind of Akusala exam. <laughs> oh, <I see>. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> right, okay. So, uh, yeah, yeah. 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 So how can we explain that this uh, strong grasping of those actions with relatively small glass? So Kiriya It's like uh, this is not grasping in terms of uh, Upada. No? It means now even an Arahant has to develop his qualities. For example, Arahants also, after become Arahants, they can, they have to develop they are spiritual qualities. Now, for example, Mahamuggalana's case. Mahamuggalana became an Arahant, but he didn't possess any Abhinyana. He had to have the Jhanas later. So while he was meditating as an Arahant, there's a story in the uh, uh, Parajika Pali, he heard sounds and he had to inquire from the Buddha, what was these sounds and all forth. So the commentary says this was after his Arahanthood. So even he had to develop his qualities. So, when he is developing these qualities, these alobado samoha, they makes, it brings a habitual impact into them and he get more established in these. Now, for example, even among the arahans who have abhinyana, the supernatural powers, some can uh, perform these abhinyanas in an instant. We call kippa nisantita. But some arahans cannot do it. So, there was an incident in which uh, uh, one arahant, very young one, uh, saved a Mahatera out of a uh, danger, uh, saved a uh, serpent out of a danger. So then uh, the Mahatera instructed the remaining Arahans also to develop your Abhinya skills till uh, uh, like this young, young, young venerable. So likewise, uh, Arahans also uh, get matured in the spiritual practice. But their vipassana is, is fully done and they are no Akusalas. But in terms of spirituality, they still develop. Right. That's why I mentioned, so it, it takes the object firmly. So then, uh, uh, we, uh, 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 what I want to say was, uh, when the mind is well established on the repulsiveness, it cannot be uh, disturbed easily by loba. In the same manner, when someone has a very strong metta, it cannot be disturbed by dosa. And with the strong grasping of, uh, grasping means strong taking of the object by amoha is very clear. For example, think about the two words that you have to memorize. Right? One word you know the meaning and you memorize, the other you don't know the meaning and memorize. Because if you know the meaning, your wisdom is more higher regarding that particular term. So what will remain in your mind for a longer time? When you memorize something with the meaning, with a full understanding, comprehensive understanding, it will remain in your mind more stronger than you have a less understanding. So this is the reason why I say the mind become well established 
on a particular object. Another thing is a vipassana understanding. So when you gain a certain understanding in vipassana, it's not like you gain through uh, jhanas. Jhana means not I mean, samadhi. Because understanding gained through vipassana is more stronger and stable. The reason is amoha, when you, when you see the truth with amoha, this will make a very strong impact. The reason is not the object because of the power of the amoha. It takes the object very firmly. It penetrates into the object. See the truth of the object. So then the mind, the whole entire mind stream become well established on that particular understanding. So that is why Aloba Adosa Amoha also makes the mind to become well established on a particular object. So it can be easily seen in the unwholesome side. Loba dosa moha. In aloba dosa moha also, we can understand this uh, firmness in, in cognition. Right? Uh, so I'll repeat again. The, it happens because these mentalities, mulas, take the object strongly. As a result, as a result, the associating mentalities and the following mentalities get well established, entrenched on a particular object. Then the second one is by bringing up conducive mental atmosphere for, uh, for associating mentalities to grow upon. For associating mentalities to grow upon. So bringing up a conducive environment. Mental atmosphere. So it's not a physical atmosphere, it's a mental atmosphere. So how does it do? Roots carry nutriment from the soil into the tree. So the tree grows well and happens to sustain for a longer period. In the same manner, mulas cause the conducive mental atmospheres for mentality to grow upon relevant objects and actions. So this is done with loba especially. Loba, when it gets attached to a particular object, it starts to admire the object. What happens? The Vedana. Vedana starts to taste the flavor of the object very strongly and it starts to uh, enjoy it. You know, we know the Vedana, we discuss about this feeling. Uh, chitta cognizes the object. Every chitta, ha every object has a particular flavor in it. The flavor, according to the tradition, is inbuilt of the inbuilt in the object. Sometimes the mind may take the natural flavor of the object. Sometimes the mind may take uh, a different flavor of object in a different manner. So the same object can be a pleasant to someone, so it can be unpleasant to someone. But according to the tradition, according to Theravada traditions, objects can be divided into pleasant and unpleasant, the re ultimate realities. But when it comes to the uh, concepts, I'm, not, I'm not unable to say how they divide it. So they doesn't give a, don't give a very detailed exposition on this. But the fundamental theory of a Theravadians is the objects can be ultimately grouped, whether it's a pleasant or unpleasant. So they give a criterion for this. It's, a, it's introduced in the commentaries. They say, uh, take a, a, a situation in which the society is um, well functioning. So examples are given for during a Buddha's era or a universal monarch's era in a, in a, in a time that the uh, society is not corrupted. So during that time, exclude the highest, highest uh, clan like the kings and the, the king's family and so forth and the very low poor people in the middle class starting from the ministers to the normal householders. So in, in within this range, when in a, such a society, whatever ob normally the objects which are considered good in general sense, <coughs> we are asked to consider them as pleasant. Objects which are considered bad in generally are, are said to be uh, unpleasant. But this is not an ultimate criteria because it changes from a country to country, culture to culture. This is not an ultimate criteria. This is how they have introduced because it's very difficult to say because. Because the Buddha has mentioned it uh, has a uh, pleasant and unpleasant, we can, uh, someone can argue this greatly depends on the person's perspective. That is true when you come into the Javana level of the chittas, like the functioning chittas. But when it comes to the Vipaka level, like the eye consciousness, 
when it comes to the uh, some particular santirana levels which happens before the javanas at that time our preference doesn't matter our preference doesn't matter so to decide the vedana or the kusala vipaka kusala vipaka nature of a, a resultant consciousness they had to introduce this kind of a realistic uh, ultimate uh, definition ultimate division of pleasant and unpleasant objects but when it comes to the javana level mostly our cultural influence or the uh, the uh, uh, environment we have grown uh, grow upon or gets the biggest uh, influence of to for us to decide whether object is pleasant or unpleasant so for this ultimate definition of a pleasant and unpleasant object is applied mainly when it comes uh, because it was uh, when it comes to decide the vedana of uh, vipaka consciousness which is a uh, resultant of the past karma which in which our preference doesn't play the role it's before and after the javanas so so it is a, it is a something that uh, we will be discussing briefly when we come to the aramana lessons aramana lessons and we don't have much information regarding this uh, criterion so so what i wanted to say is now chitta takes the object chitta takes a object so why chitta takes the object there is a mental uh, called vedana which becomes sensitive to the flavor the flavor of an object flavor so according to the uh, uh, most of the theravadian scholars they suggest flavor is an inbuilt attribute of the object it is not the not the object it is an inbuilt attribute of the object with be based on which which we can consider a object is pleasant or unpleasant a pleasant or unpleasant so this when the chitta takes the object the vedana becomes sensitive to this flavor if the vedana takes a pleasant flavor we call it a sukha somanasa vedana if the vedana takes an unpleasant flavor we call it uh, dukkha domanasa vedana if vedana takes the uh, middle flavor like neutral flavor we call it upekha vedana it can happen the object itself may contain a pleasant flavor or the person even if it is unpleasant flavor the object the person's uh, mind may also effect to take it as pleasant that is why seeing a very unpleasant objects like uh, repulsive objects a person may can still have jhana so like still have very high concentration with a happy full mind so this is a uh, uh, this will go to a very detailed uh, reason uh, detailed explanation uh, i think we explained this bit detailedly when you we were in vedana so what i wanted to say is now the loba when the loba admires the object likes the object they are associating vedana because of the influence of the loba and also the chitta and also the moha the vedana starts to admire the flavor taste the flavor the pleasant flavor so more the flavor is felt in a pleasant manner more the flavor is felt in a pleasant manner the loba get stronger why do we like a certain object it gives us a very pleasant feeling so more that it gives a pleasant feeling more we get attached to a particular object so loba facilitates the vedana by attaching and also moha plays a role by attaching and also covering the truth for vedana to flavor taste the pleasant flavor of the object this when the vedana is flavoring the pleasant flavor the mind get well entrenched on a particular object we start to get attached to that object so it is by creating the atmosphere loba itself grabs the object strongly when it grabs the object it also facilitates vedana to taste the flavor of the object in a higher level so the mind gets well established same thing happens with dosa dosa makes the vedana to feel the unpleasant object more the unpleasant object is where dosa becomes more stronger in the uh, object then when it come to uh, momola chittas in which moha is only found at that time the mind starts to uh, enjoy the habitual type of enjoy habitual type of uh, influence starts to happen when it starts to doubt and also start to get restless so then even though we don't enjoy it mind naturally tends to do that 
then actually the mind likes to doubt, likes to means goes into doubt. So when uh, the doubt and the uh, restlessness are getting stronger due to moha, so the mind starts to admire these unbending or useless types of mental patterns, doubting and becoming restless. So the mind easily starts to get the habit of re getting restless or getting doubt, uh, getting doubtful. So this happens when the moha is very powerful. More powerful the moha, we get a very higher level of doubt and restlessness. And then it facilitates the Vedana to enjoy, like the minds to enjoy this, this, this uh, useless types of mental activities. So then the mind starts to grow on these actions. Like, uh, and also when we talk about actions, so, uh, Loba starts to admire certain actions, certain unwholesome sensual actions. So when the Vedana starts to enjoy, Loba, uh, mind starts to do it again and again. That is what we happen in addiction. So uh, all the addictions according to the Buddhist teachings is based because of this mula function of Loba. Mula function of Loba. More the Vedana enjoys it, more Loba takes the object attached to it and it allows the Vedana to enjoy it. More you get attached, more it starts to add, uh, feel the flavor. More you feel the flavor, more you get attached again and again. So it's like inter, uh, uh, mutually supporting each other. So likewise, uh, actions we do with dosa, moha also get very stronger due to this uh, mental nature. So if I conclude this lecture, now when, in, when it comes to the wholesome roots, it does the function in a different manner, not through Vedana. Now the Loba Dosa Moha did the strengthening by allowing the Vedana to feel the taste. But when it comes to Aloba Dosa Moha, when our Lady Sarah suggests that, it is done by suppressing the opposite, opposite mental states. Aloba suppresses Loba, Adosa suppresses Dosa, Amoha suppresses Moha. So when the mind gets away from these burning defilements, what happens? There is a natural experience that we are unable to express uh, in a certain way. When the mind is free from defilement, free from defilement means wholesome when we say about getting rid of defilements in Buddhist teachings, it's not just the absence of defilements. Keep this in mind. Just mere absence of defilements is not the suppression. Real suppression happens. You have to develop the opposite qualities. It means, for example, I'll discuss this in detail when we come to the lecture of Pahana at the end of this semester. It will, not, it will come later after many weeks. I'll just uh, give a, a information on this. When we are talking about pahana, eradication, Buddhist, Buddhism, when we say we get rid of akusalas, it's not just the mere absence of akusala. You have to develop an opposite state, then you have to get rid of akusala. Otherwise, sometimes when we have sorrow, dosa, connected with dosa, we are sad. Some goes to a bar and starts to enjoy. So, in this manner, when the loba is there, there is no dosa, no saro. So, we can, someone can argue, by bringing loba, you can suppress dosa. According to Buddhist teachings, this is not a suppression. This is a replacement. Replacement and suppression are two things. Suppression means it has to be done with the opposite force. Akusala has to be suppressed by kusala, not by another akusala. So, when the aloba is present, the latent loba will be suppressed. When the adosa is present, latent dosa will be suppressed. When the amoha is present, latent moha will be suppressed. So, what happens to the mind? The mind starts to get a certain spiritual bliss. Our mind feels very comfortable. Very, uh, uh, it becomes right, uh, we feel a very pleasant, tranquil nature. So this kind of tranquility, that pleasant, sweet, spiritual bliss can only be experienced by developing wholesome qualities and this happens, two reasons, the mental qualities themselves are very pleasant and the next reason is when the mind is getting far away from the defilements, it also starts to get spiritual bliss. 
So how Aloba Adosa Amoha makes their minds to be very stable in certain actions. When Aloba suppresses Loba, Adosa suppresses Dosa, Amoha suppresses Moha, because of this spiritual bliss, the mind starts to enjoy it, mind starts to like it and mind starts, the person starts to do the actions again and again. So when you want to get established in the spirituality, sometimes in the beginning we may strive because of our effort, but we get well established when we experience the spiritual bliss. When we have such an experience of the calmness, of meditation, of purity, of sila, the real blissful enjoyment in dana, so when we have this kind of a serene feeling, that time our mind naturally inclines to do the wholesome deeds. No one needs to push us because we know it by with our own experience. Mind starts to, sometimes you may do bad things, but mind knows, the, we know that what is the real bliss. So we get well, we call the mind is well established in the spiritual path. So this is done by Kusala Mulas by suppressing Akusala, Aloba, Adosa, Loba, Dosa and Moha. When it comes to the Arahant, the functional consciousness, Arahants have already eradicated the impurities. So it was done with Kusala Mulas. So their mind is always in the spiritual bliss. The mind is soft in the spiritual bliss and their mind also get strengthened whenever they start, uh, they keep on doing a particular action. So this is how I would explain the Mulas we discuss about two aspects they get established on a particular object through good focusing and then creating the bringing up a conducive mental atmosphere in the akusala side by bringing up a pleasant unpleasant and uh, the feelings like enjoying that flavors in the wholesome side by suppressing the burning defilements we create a spiritual atmosphere to the mind and soft in this or cultured in this spiritual place, the mind get well established on good wholesome deeds, right? So these are, uh, so that is what we have to say. If someone wants to get well firmly established on the spiritual practice, what they have to do is to develop these wholesome qualities, aloha, adosa, and amoha, and also uh, if the addictions also comes with this loba, dosa, and moha, especially addiction is because of loba. So this is the lecture I want to uh, give. So if there are any questions, yeah. I'm still very confused about the object part when we uh, was explaining the, the neutral object because this is my understanding. Okay, I'm going to explain my understanding to you. So the object itself is neutral. It's not like good or bad or you know, wholesome or unwholesome. And let's say even that there's an innate flavor of, uh, of the object. And then take the level of vipaka when it's very weak. From my understanding that that kind of level when the, uh, the conscious the mind taking that object, then it's because of the past karma or whatever it is, the past conditions that then will be implied to the object. If the past conditions with more kusala, then it, it takes more inclination to the object in terms of kusala side, or, but the object is still uh, neutral. Does it make sense? And then if your past uh, past condition is uh, kusala. Uh, kusala, uh, kusala, then the inclination towards the object would be a kusala. That is just the vipaka side. When it's going to move up to the next phrase with the uh, chawana function, where especially now, with wisdom, you can change that akusala inclination to kusala, or you can actually increase that kusala by the past condition. However, the object itself still remains neutral. But in this case, you was explaining that object is actually divided into the optimate reality, where it's actually kusala to all, all the way at the vipaka um, phrase. So, uh, if I explain, I got your point. Thank you for that. So if I explain how the traditions come to this point, it's a very subtle, subtle and profound discussion, this point. So when we say if it is the cause is vipaka, for example, kusala, cause of the vipaka, kusala vipaka. Right? So this it is taking a certain object. Right? 
the setting object. Object we don't define is a kusal object or kusal object as you said. It can be whatever object it is. So according to the tradition, based on the Buddha's teaching, some fundamental teachings that the kusala vipaka, kusala will bring pleasant vipaka always. A kusala will bring unpleasant vipakas. So what the tradition says is, when it says this phrase of the Buddha, it says attanam, it is impossible that a kusala will become unpleasant results, a kusala will become present results. So when a kusala, someone has done a kusala, it is a kusala vipaka, kusala vipaka. So normally we say the object it encounters is a pleasant one. It's not the kusala, we don't explain it based on kusala side or kusala side, it's a pleasant one. So that's why a person who has done kusala and goes in the deva realm, he gets a very pleasant object. So the tradition says this pleasantness of the object is always, is always is most of the times, forget about the nibbana and all these cases because they are not objects of vipaka, is always, it is always supportive to loba. supportive to loba. The reason is our mind stream, the samsara, is made, made means functioning, supportive to the loba, not supportive to the kusala. So the, how the tradition explains, they are, the tradition face a problem in this approach, even focusing on a pleasant object which is appealing to loba, which is very pleasant, the mind likes this pleasant object and the natural tendency to attach to it. How could you get kusala chitta based on such an object? So then they explain about Yonuso Manasikara and so forth. So as your question came, if I if I put this to your question into the traditional perspective, so the object normally all the objects, all the objects are supportive to loba or dosa. We don't call objects supportive to kusala or akusala. We call the object supportive to loba and dosa. Normal. So, if an object is supportive to dosa means, the tradition would say, this is an unpleasant object. Then, if it is, if the object is unpleasant, they would call it is a akusala vipaka which takes the object. I know this discussion is not going to end, right? This, this, there will be lots of counter questions that you can raise. So that's why I want just I would say how the tradition explains the tradition, the traditional point of view. As you said, your explanation I, I uh, appreciate it. The, uh, the traditional explanation is not that object. It is not supporting to kusala side or akusala side. Object which is taken to vipaka, taken by vipaka, if it is pleasant, we call it it's, it's supportive to loba, and if it is unpleasant, it's supportive to dosa. Why it is supportive to loba? Loba is the main reason for our continuation. Then we come to why it is the loba is the main reason. We come into a, a theory called, uh, I think we explained this theory, it's like the theory which supports for the uh, continuation. It means uh, 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 prof, uh, phenomenon of efficacy. If you remember, I think last last year we discussed some of this. So the naturally the mind the process goes, process happens in an effic efficient way. What are the efficiencies? The sansara has to continue. That is the normal natural flow. The mind should take the object. Uh, in a whole manner, not partially, completely. I think we discussed this matter very detailed, I don't know, uh, in, in the last semester. I'll be discussing them again in the conditionality, in detail. So, the thing is, the, traditionally, what I want to say, I'll conclude the answer, uh, the objects are decided, supportive to loba and supportive to dosa. There, as you said, Chiyare, there is an explanation called Kusala object, Akusala object. Supportive to Kusala, supportive to Akusala, there is such an explanation. I don't, I don't deny that. There is such an explanation. But when you go to this fundamental level of Vipaka Chitta, Vipaka Chitta level, we divide the object supportive to Loba and supportive to Dosa. When you, when you talk about the objects of Javana, we have a classification, as you said, supportive to Kusala and supportive to Akusala. Right, so uh, so it's a, what I wanted to say. It's it's a, a complicated issue, 
and configured means because they are they are based on the suttas. They are based on such suttas and they bring such a definition. So traditional point of view is uh, there is a flavor in the object. I'm unable to explain how the panyakti objects have a flavor, right? But realities, they say they have a flavor in an object. That flavor is felt by the Veda. So the problem, they were, the thing is, Vipaka Chittas doesn't, is not influenced by our preferences. Is not influenced by preferences. So they take the object as, they, as it is. So the thing is, if a Vipaka Chitta experiences the pleasant flavor, so counterly, they may, uh, 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 reversely they say object was pleasant. If the Vipaka Chitta have a, a neutral flavor or is produced by Akusala, we call the object had an unpleasant flavor. That is how it goes. Just out of curiosity, yeah. the last quote that you made where replacement of Akusala, yeah. Akusala yeah. and then the suppressions, right? Yeah. In terms of um, definitions of the suppressions meaning, for me suppressions mean that the Akusala suppress the Akusala, yeah. but the Akusala is still remaining there. Yes. But so in case of Arahanta, all the Akusala, they are, you know, eradicated. Yeah. So in that case, there would not be cause impression. Right? That would be a complete replacement by uh, Kusala, right? Yeah. But Correct. just for the other case, that, that would mean that there's Correct. impression. Correct. Uh, I use the word uh, superficially. The Pali word is Pahana. Pahana is twofold. Suppression. And eradication. Correct. So I was referring to this pahana, but I just use this suppression. But it has to be moved. Thank you. That's it. Then you call it. Oh, <laughs> okay. For example, if you take the Buddha, that's yeah. the, the zero. Are you, now you are talking about this uh, flavor, right? Yeah. Oh, I, I shall we discuss this when we come to the Aramana? Right? We'll discuss this about how we need to come to Aramana. Okay then, so we'll... Uh... <laughs>